Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, we are a webinar. Um, you can call us that. We won't be offended by it. Um, we cover a variety of any library uh, topics and interests. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch, both our live show on Wednesday mornings and our recordings. Um, we do these sessions live every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you are unable to watch them, um, join us live on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can go on to our website and find all of our recordings for all of our previous sessions. Um, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, basically anything um, related to libraries we are happy to have on the show. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations sometimes, but we also bring in guest speakers as we have this morning. Um, on the line with us this morning is Andrew Sherm, uh, Sherman from the Sump Memorial Library up in Papillion, Nebraska, and they've just recently, uh, in the last a uh, couple of years, I'm not sure how long it took, gone through a big change, going, uh, getting a new ILS for their library um, with a bunch of other libraries joined in as well. So um, he's going to just take us through uh, how, how they pulled it off. <laughs> so uh, go ahead and take it away, Sherm. Hi, everybody. Hear me okay? Yep, you sound good. Okay. Uh, as Chris said, I'm the IT coordinator of some of our library. Uh, almost two years ago, we joined the Pioneer Consortium. Uh, when we realized that our Follett ILS was was not meeting our needs, um, we had concerns about the old server it was running on, and we knew we needed to migrate to something new. Um, as part of our membership of the consortium, um, I've been assisting a lot of libraries that have joined us and helped them uh, review uh, the, the COA ILS from PPFS we use as is our ILS in the consortium, and also if they've chosen to go with us, I've helped a lot of small libraries through their migration effort. And uh, from that, um, I've kind of put together kind of a best tips and practices. So, um, you know, if you're a library that's got an ILS that's out of date, not meeting your needs, or what's commonly um, we've dealt with as part of the Pioneer is the library's got their ILS running on a creaky old server that nobody knows if it's going to last much longer, and uh, nobody's really sure if it's even being backed up correctly and things like that. Um, by moving to um, a cloud-based ILS like what we utilize, where our, our vendor um, maintains all that for us out in their data center and we access it over the Internet, um, allows us to kind of get out of the uh, risk of, you know, where ILS runs on a single server, and if that server quits working, then, you know, we're pretty much out of business. So we'll just uh, go through uh, some of the stuff that uh, we've uncovered over our experiences. So the way to kind of look at the migration process is really you could treat it like a move. Um, instead of physically packing up stuff in boxes and moving it to a new location, it's more of a digital move where you're going to be packing up the information in your current ILS and we're going to be moving it to the new one. Um, obviously, it's a lot of work. And, you know, for a lot of us, you know, we have our full-time jobs and the library has to be fully operational for our patrons while we're doing this, which makes it both disruptive and stressful. Just like, you know, if you're, you're buying a new house, you're trying to move your family into a new home, well, you still got everyday life to deal with on top of this. So, you know, you got to um, concentrate on the positive and, you know, remember the good reasons why you're doing this and what's important and what, how it's going to benefit you and what makes all this work and, and effort worth it. Um, we have kind of see it as in kind of a four-stage process. So there's the selection of, of the new ILS you're going to go for. Um, there's the, the preparation for the move, um, then the migration of the move itself, and then kind of once you're past the you know, the initial uh, up and running on the new system, you definitely want to circle back and uh, see what, what's working, what's not, um, you know, what you can do to make things work better, take advantage of the, of the features of the ILS that you didn't have before. Um, selection, in, in our case and with a lot of the libraries I've worked with, um, it, it really doesn't come down to 
you know, all the iOSs pretty much have the same features. Some have a few more bells and whistles than others, but most of the libraries I've dealt with um, have been Follette libraries who have not even kept their Follette up to date and are years behind um, in, the, in the capabilities even Follette offers. So really at this point, a lot of the libraries are kind of the point where just about anything is going to be better uh, than what they're currently using. Um, the other thing we've really discovered that um, cost tends to be the driver here. Um, you know, some libraries have a, a few features that are important to them that they like, but it really seems to all come down to cost. And as we've been working with libraries as part of the consortium, um, it's kind of interesting is depending when the library last purchased an iOS, you can almost kind of figure out who had the most affordable product on the market. So, if, you know, they went between these few years, they're all Follette libraries. If they went through these few years, maybe they're all SageMesh libraries. So they really, it seems it was driven by, you know, who had the most affordable solution. Um, the other thing we commonly see is, you know, what do the neighbors have? So it's a like, you know, if your lawnmower dies, you've got to get a new one. So you look them down the street on Saturday morning and see what kind of lawnmowers your neighbors have. Um, we see a lot of libraries that are, that are in the same area and maybe work closely together tend to use the same ILS also because it allows them to support one another. So, you know, if you have a library with a long-term staff and then maybe you have some retirements and stuff, when those, that, that new staff into that library are able to um, kind of pick the brains of the libraries around them if they're, you know, coming in and learning, having to learn a new ILS as part of the new job. Uh, another really thing is, you know, if the vendor has kind of a, a play space or something where you can kind of go out and they can give you a login to a, a demo version of the product where you can actually kind of go through the motions of how it's going to work in your library and see whether you like it or not. Um, you know, give it a test drive. Uh, the big, big thing is to um, be aware that really there's, I can't really see any reason why any library, especially Smallwood, would want to have a server-based ILS where they're responsible for maintaining the server and having it in-house. Um, I'm sure you've all heard the buzzword, the cloud. Um, it it kind of has a little different connotation now, but pretty much what we call software, the service SaaS is not new. It's been around for a long time. That's the idea is you buy the vendor's product and then they actually host it for you in one of their data centers and they take care of all the hardware in that for it. And you're really only dependent on your internet connectivity to get out there and make use of it. So it gets you out of the, the responsibility for the, uh, the backup and, you know, the hardware of a server itself. The critical thing there is, of course, make sure you pick a vendor that's, um, that's solid financially is going to be around for a while. And uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, if they would suddenly close the doors and got a business and your ILS is no longer there, which shouldn't be an issue. Um, most of the vendors with all the mergers and acquisitions that are out there now are pretty solid. Um, again, it takes care of the backup stuff for you. And then the thing to understand then is in this situation, um, most of these ILSs now have an interface through the browser. So um, the browser is your face of their product. And for example, the um, in the Pioneer Consortium, the preferred browser by vendor is Firefox. And I know some uh, libraries where their uh, IT managers by the city, sometimes there's some very, very strict security requirements where the city won't allow any other browser than, say, Internet Explorer, things like that. So that's something that you really want to be aware of, that if, you know, if your uh, a vendor says, you know, we test and we expect you to use this browser, a Firefox or a Chrome or a Safari or an Internet Explorer, is the expected browser to front end our product. You need to make sure that it's going to be okay to use that and that it's something you can install and use on your computers. Uh, again, when the ILS is based out in the cloud, um, your connectivity to it is good as your Internet connection. So if you're a library possibly in a rural area where your Internet connection is not very fast or you know, goes in and out a lot. Um, that's something to consider that maybe, you know, unfortunately the cloud's not going to work for you based on your internet connectivity. You do need to have it hosted on a server in-house. Um, that's not near the issue it used to be, but hopefully um, 
you could, you'll be able to take advantage of a cloud setup uh, and you have a good enough internet connectivity to support that. On preparation, again, you know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. I'm sure we've all heard that before. And it's just like a move. If you've helped, if you've done moves in your own, or you've helped friends move, you know, the move that where everything's planned out, the boxes are packed and clearly labeled, you know, it's easy to tell where things are going and how it's going to get done, makes for a much less stressful move than if you just kind of, you know, just go for it and just throw stuff in a in a truck and try and get it across town in a new house. Same thing here. The better you can plan and be prepared for it and have everybody knowing what they're doing and when, it just takes a lot of the stress and, uh, and agony out of the uh, workout. Um, inventory. A really, really good thing to do would be to complete an inventory before the migration to ILS. So you kind of know what you have and you know, you know what, what you're bringing over um, to the new ILS. So if, you're, if your current ILS has issues with the data, just because you're going to a new ILS, that's not going to go away. You will bring those, those problems with you. So if, you know, it's the idea of different dogs saying please. If you have issues with the data in your old ILS and you're migrating to a new ILS and you don't fix that stuff first, you're kind of going to still be dealing with the same issues in the new one. Um, the other thing is what we call is extraction or extract. Do you know how or do you have support from your vendor to get that data out of your old ILS and keep files that can be easily imported into the new ILS? And this is also a really good time. Uh, a lot of times part of that migration, this is an opportunity to maybe those issues with your data we talked about, this is a good opportunity maybe to work with your ILS vendor and maybe sneak in some mass updating or mass changes as part of this extraction and import process to clean stuff up. Um, if you don't know what a mark record is, you need to know what a mark record is because this is the language that everybody will be talking about when they're moving your collection from one ILS to another. Uh, mark is the standard and that's what they're going to be talking is mark, mark records and mark fields. So the more you know about it, the more knowledgeable you are, the better it will go. Uh, the other thing that was new to me when we moved that I didn't realize until we started our research is there is kind of an international 14-digit barcode standard for both the barcodes on your patron cards and the barcodes on your items. Um, the ILS we went to has the expectation of your um, using that standard. Now fortunately for us, um, our vendor PPFS has, has added some additional features that allowed us to um, retain our old partial um, ballet barcodes so we didn't have to read barcode everything as part of our migration. Um, we were able to add some, take advantage of a feature where um, by programming our scanners to drop some of the problematic, problematic stuff when we scan an item or a patron's card, um, RLS would then fill it with the, the prefix and the zero fill that produced the true 14 digit um, number or code as it went into the ILS. So we didn't have to do a bunch of relabeling. Um, depending on what vendor you pick with and where you go, that's something to be aware of. You know, do they expect you to support a 14-digit standard, or do they support the standard that you have in your library for how your barcodes are set up, and can they make it work? Um, really, nobody wants to have to go through the, the workout of relabeling their collection um, to conform to a, a different standard for barcoding from their ILS vendor. Uh, the other thing we discovered was because we had been with Follett for a number of years, and they had done, obviously, different philosophies on how their barcoding worked through the years and then even acquisition and merger of other ILS vendors into their system, um, we discovered that what was printed on our barcode was not actually in the human readable part of the barcode, was not what was actually in the barcode. Um, and we really ran into an issue where we thought we were going to have to seek out these really old barcoded books and relabel them. Um, but what was again nice with a combination of um, programming our barcode scanners to toss stuff out, and then the, uh, the prefixing feature that uh, Koha had, we were able to resolve those problems, and it was nice. I used to be a barcode programmer back in the day, so I had a lot of knowledge and experience in that. Um, if I hadn't, we really might have been in a bad spot and not even realized uh, that 
program, programming our scanners was even an option to us. And what we I wound up helping a lot of libraries um, with acquiring uh, use programmable scanners that we could then program to solve the same issues they had with follow up barcodes that we had. Another great opportunity here, you know, obviously it's a you know the migration ILS you might feel like you have a, enough going on that you don't want to take on you know a reorganization library where you want to change your shelving method, which might involve changing spine labels on your books for your uh, um, shelving, how you do your shelving codes, you know, by author name or or Dewey or that. Um, we had a kind of a weird setup in our our children's picture books where everything's were categorized into um, holiday books. Um, it was just kind of a weird deal. It made it very difficult for patrons to locate what they wanted. So we decided as part of our migration, uh, we redid all the um, spine labels and call numbers for the books in our our children's picture book section, so it was all based, you know, kind of the standard method of doing um, nonfiction off the author name. So it made it much easier to find stuff. And what made it this the time to do that is we were able to incorporate those those changes as part of the transfer of our data from our old ILS to our new ILS. We were able to extract the data out of the old ILS, work with the programmers at PPFS to go in and write a little program that modified those call numbers to what we wanted them to be. And then so when we went live on the new ILS, we had team volunteers come in and assist us with reorganizing our picture book section. And it, it was kind of the, the problem nobody wanted to take on because it was going to be so much work. But by incorporating it into the migration of our ILS, we actually were much more efficient. We had, you know, we were going to have to do a lot of this anyway, so this was a great time to take that on and fix it. Um, policy changes, because the ILS is such an important part of the library, um, what, that workflow and how you do things really is based on, you know, how your ILS does things. So if you've been on, you know, a vendor's ILS for years and years and years, kind of the the operating procedure, the process you use to check a book out, check a book in, do holds in that really is based off how that flow works through your ILS. So going to a new one, um, you could see a significant change in, in maybe how you do your holds and things like that. And then that gets back to um, you know what kind of rules are allowed for fines, how fines are calculated and things like that. Um, especially if you join a consortium where everybody's, you know, sharing the same ILS database, you may have to conform to how the rule, how the consortium set their standards for when do we decide an item is lost, how do we charge fines, things like that, and that may change, be different from how you do it currently, resulting in a policy change. And a lot of libraries, you have to go to your library board and have those policy changes approved. So that's something you definitely want done long before you're ready to do the, the migration. You want to figure out, okay, the consortium, the book's been overdue for, for three weeks. Um, the ILS one considers it lost. You know, and if it used to be you would give the patron three months before you mark their item as lost and charge them for it, that's going to be a policy change, and you may need to have board approval to affect that. So keep that in mind. Another thing to think about is depending on how many people you have to come in and help with this migration and move, and how long it will take the vendor to actually get you live on the new ILS, should you close for a day? Do you need to close for a day? Um, our library is open seven days a week, and uh, there really wasn't you know, a, a day that we could do this where we weren't going to impact patrons. Uh, Monday tends to actually be our slowest day, so we chose to close on a Monday. And then what we did is when we wrapped up business Sunday at 5, um, we extracted all of our current data from the old ILS, um, uploaded it to um, our vendor, who then began the migration to the new ILS. And then while they were doing that overnight, then we came in early Monday morning and we did all of our, our validation and checks to make sure the data came through clean and properly. 
and then we had some stuff to fix. We had a little, you know, there's always a few issues to clean up, but then we had a nice, solid, clean, ready to go um, ILS when we went, we're back in business on Tuesday. Um, patron communication. This is huge. You don't want to just do something like this where the, you know, if the, you have patrons that actively maybe log in from a computer at home to, to do placeholds or renew books. Um, obviously with the new ILS, the interface your patrons have or the, the OPAC uh, screen for them is going to change and things will be different. Um, we started communicating a year out to our patrons that we were going to be migrating to a new ILS. And as we learned more and could share more details, we did that. And we even offered training um, ahead of time to our patrons using a, a sandbox or a, 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 a testing version that our vendor provided for our ILS where we were actually able to have our patrons come in and we could show them what the new ILS was going to work and, and train them on how to do uh, renewals and holds before we were even live on it yet. We did that a couple weeks out and we did classes afterwards too and that was the same uh, sandbox, the same tool we used to train all the staff on the new ILS before we moved ahead. So migrating, how we test and train. I just talked about the sandbox. This is a huge, huge feature. Um, the idea, and we had some libraries we helped migrate where they did not take the time to train their staff on the new um, system. They literally were on the old system one day and the new system the next, and the staff were figuring it out as they went along. Uh, that works, but I don't recommend it. It was very, very stressful and uh, very, very painful. So it, make sure your vendor has the ability for you to um, train on a system ahead of time. What was nice about what PPFS provided to our consortium is we actually were able to do a kind of a test migration where we were able to bring all of our data over into the sandbox environment and see what came over correctly and what didn't. So we knew about those before we did the actual live migration. And then we were able to actually train our staff and they were able to train on our, our catalog, our items. So we weren't using somebody else's stuff that was maybe set up a little different. We were actually able to train our staff on how this was going to work based on how we catalog and classify and shelf our items. Um, gets back to where I talked about earlier, that you know the system really defines your workflow. Uh, one of the things we really, really liked about um, uh, Koha over our old Fallout system was the old Fallout system when you would have an item come in, you check it in and you had a hold on it, we were writing out paper hold slips. Um, the PTFS system prints a hold slip for you, pops a little screen, you hit OK, and it prints the hold slip with all that information on it, you just stick it in the book and put it on the shelf. So it changed our workflow in a good way. The staff really, really liked that feature, but it did change you know, how we handle our holds a little bit different. Um, testing. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of test decks. It's kind of a, a common practice um, in the programming world and quality assurance for software where you have the database loaded with um, kind of a known setup. So if you run reports, these are the totals you expect to see and things like that. And then a test deck would basically be, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to catalog an item. So here's the steps I take, A, B, C, D, E, and that was your test deck for cataloging. So you, when you were ready to get in the sandbox and start training in testing, you could run through these test decks over your, your commonly done practices. So you saw how things worked. You could identify an issue if there was one that it could get fixed. And those test decks then lead right into creating the training documentation or training aids for your staff. Um, we required all of our staff to be able to do uh, all the common tasks um, in the sandbox, and they were tested on it. So, for example, our aides, uh, their supervisor, they had to sit down and the supervisor said, okay, let's check the book out, let's check the book in, let's put a book on hold. And they actually had to go through that in the sandbox and show that they, they knew how to do it and could do it without you know, any confusion or slowness or anything like that. So we were ready to go day one. I can't stress the training ahead of time enough. Um, it just, it's going to solve so many problems right up front. 
make everything run so much smoother, um, eliminate your drama, uh, gets the staff to buy in, they get a chance to kind of get over their apprehensions before then. And then again, we, odd, we offer training sessions for our patrons. Um, I will share, though, that we, we scheduled a lot of training classes for our patrons, and we had very low participation in it. Um, and then after we were live on a new one, they were coming in and saying, can you show me how to do this? So then we kind of fell back on one-on-one, -on -one, going over to one of the uh, OPAC computers and showing them how to do it one-on-one -on -one, um, after the fact, which was fine. Uh, the people wanted help got it and worked for us. Um, once you actually migrate, these test decks are a great way to then do your check and confirmation. So if you had a test deck based on um, a report you were going to run, so we should see these kind of numbers come out for what's on hold, um, what our fine totals and things are, so we could take a, a, a fine report from Follett on our old system and then compare it to the fine report we got out of the migrated data over to our COHA system and those numbers should match. If they don't, then you know right away something has not migrated cleanly and you need to dig into it and find out what's wrong. So, you know, having a standard, having your standard set of reports that you use with your old ILS and then running those standard reports as part of the migration on your new ILS and comparing those numbers is a great, great way to uh, check and see the results and make sure everything came through cleanly. Um, once you're through your migration, this is where you really want to kind of follow up. So you want to basically, you know, kind of sit down, get everybody around the table if you can, and say, okay, we're, we're there, we're on the new ILS, you know, what, what went well, you know, what was, what was, what worked, what didn't work, did we run into good surprises, which are great, did we have bad surprises, which are not, what didn't work so well. Um, that kind of sets up your list for what needs to get cleaned up. So what's your follow-up and fixing? You know, the idea of, you know, are you going to live in your house for six months with stuff still packed in boxes? Are you going to get after it and get everything put the way where it's supposed to go? So this is kind of where you build a cleanup list of, okay, we had some bad records that, that need to be addressed. Um, we had some staff that are struggling. They need to, they need to get some training. Um, obviously, you know, the idea of those report comparisons again, where maybe it's, you know, you dumped a list of what was in the old one and a list of the new one and compared those counts in, by categories and things like that. So you really want to be diligent about um, once the migration is complete, you want to stay on, stay on target, have it part of your plan to address the issues that need to be addressed, to take advantage of the new features you didn't have before, and make sure you're getting every sense worth out of the uh, the new ILS you've gone to. We talked a little bit about, you know, going to the new ILS can definitely change the workflow um, that you have. So, again, that's part of the follow-up. So, you know, here's a feature that we think will save us a lot of time and effort that we do not have in the old ILS. Um, now's the time to sit down, study it, understand it, and get it activated and in use and take advantage of it, which is one of the great, you know, one of the great capabilities of the new ILS. The other thing to think about is if you were on a very, very old dinosaur ILS, obviously technology has, has moved quite a ways ahead from where it was at, so are there new add-on products that you can take advantage of with this ILS that you couldn't before? You know, the idea if you have public PCs in your library, are you now able to have a software package on them that allows the patrons to use their barcode to log into a public PC and begin using it that you couldn't do with the old ILS because it didn't have that ability to interface with somebody else's uh, system. So you really want to kind of build the blueprint for here's the new features, here's our new options. Um, we need to be diligent about taking advantage of them and be more efficient. So that's the end of the uh, slideshow I had.
Did anybody have any uh, questions for me? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, great, Sherm. Thank you. That was actually really good. Um, if anybody does have any questions, nothing came in while you were talking. Um, I don't know about anybody else. I was just kind of paying a lot close attention to how you guys did it and all the important parts to it. Um, I myself have not had to go through this process, but I'm sure lots of other libraries have or are planning for it. Um, if anybody does have any questions, uh, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, or if you have a microphone, just tell me you want to be unmuted, and I can do that. And we can see if you could use your microphone to ask the question. Um, now, I, I did, no, I'm not sure if everyone on the line here is aware of um, the uh, the Pioneer Consortium that we have here in Nebraska. Um, can you explain, give a little, a little detail about what, what's involved in that? And um, I know, I believe we have a mixture of sizes of libraries and types of libraries in there now. Yeah, it's we actually, pretty, um, it's pretty broad varied. Um, group of libraries across Nebraska. Um, what had happened is um, the, some of the libraries that founded the Pioneer Consortium were all looking at new ILSs and were actually I'm very put off by what the cost was going to be with the established um, vendors. Mm. And I don't know how many of you are well aware of open source software. Um, open source software is software that is um, technically it's free to use. Um, if you make any changes to it, you need to be able to put those changes back into the community base that maintains that software package. Right. Um, Koha is actually an ILS that was developed in New Zealand and they created a um, open source version of Koha. There's a Koha community, and what they do is you can download their ILS and load it on a server and run it in your library for free. You don't have to pay them anything for the software. Um, the requirements with open source is if you do any programming changes to it, to add features or do anything uh, different with it, you're required by using that to put those programming changes back to the community and then they will decide whether or not that's something they want to include in the community code base going forward. Um, the Pioneer Consortium chose to use a, a vendor, um, PTFS, to, who has um, a business of helping libraries get up and running on the Koha uh, ILS, except what you run into when you pick a, a vendor like that, and there's several others that do it, Evergreen, um, mm -hmm. I think there's two or three major players in that. And what they do is they will add features to the uh, Koha ILS that their, their customers want. And then that, what that does is it kind of creates what we call a fork in the software world. So you have the community version, which does this, and then Evergreen's added features to their version. So it's a little bit different. PTF has added features to their version, so it's a little bit different. So you kind of wind up with these vendor-specific forks of the base software. And then again, PTFS and Evergreen and all those guys are required. What they've developed and added on to Koha has to be put back to the community. So when you pick one of those vendors, you're kind of on that vendor's version of an open source ILS. Um, and you're, you're paying them for their expertise and assistance. And a lot of time, they're the ones that are offering the software as a service, too. So they have, PPFS has the data center um, that houses our databases and all our data, and we connect to them through the internet to run our ILS. And then by going with that open source model and being a little more self-reliant, we've saved a lot of money compared to going with one of the leading ILS vendors out there. Um, you know, I've more than we could see that is Koha is feature, is Koha is feature rich as some of the top um, ILSs out there. No, it's not. But it, especially for a lot of the smaller libraries in our honor consortium with us, in my library especially, um, you know, going with the top brand ILS, we would be paying for a lot of featurality that we would never need or never use. So we chose to, to go with a, a simpler ILS um, where, you know, it has the features we need, and if there's a feature that the consortium is strong, feels strongly about, we can actually pay PTFS's developers to add that feature to the um, ILS for us. So not only do we get in at a low cost, but we're really able to control the customization and the featureality we want added and made available within this ILS. So 
it's worked out very, very well for us, and, and I think we're up to 24 libraries now in the consortium, mm -hmm. and they range in size from uh, Lincoln Cities, Grand Island, um, our, obviously our larger members, you know, down to our, our smaller vendors, um, Stromsburg, uh, and some of the much smaller libraries, and it, we've been able to um, assist the smaller libraries with a lot of stuff that they wouldn't have had in the past um, or would have had to pay the vendor a lot of money for that kind of assistance. We've been able to offer that aid and assistance as part of them being in the consortium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, if anyone is, is interested, um, in the show notes that we I always have, um, after the show I have links for anything. I've put a link to the Pioneer website, the WordPress site that you guys have, so you can get more information from there and also to some Memorial's own website. Uh, and we do have one uh, request. Can you put up the slide with your contact info again, the first slide you had yep. there while we're chatting here? Um, a question. Now we do have some questions coming in while you're talking, which is great. Uh, how many other ILS systems did you look at before you did decide to go with uh, the Koha? Um, we we looked at you know the um, Bibliotics, you know pretty much the major players that were out there, and the the price was just you know we were like kind of well, there's just no way. Mm. I mean, even if we liked it, there's just no way we can afford it. And our director uh, Rob Clark has a good working relationship with. Steve Fossum at Grand Island and and uh, Pat and Lincoln and they were you know really happy with what had gone on with the uh, Pioneer Consortium, so we chose to back that effort and join it and it's been wonderful for us. Not only did we get a, a good ILS, it was much better than the old Ballette one we had. Mm -hmm. um, we we got in at a much lower cost and that's been a big driver for us and all pretty much all the other libraries I've worked on is it comes down to we just can't afford the Cadillac. Um, can you find me a Chevy to drive around? <laughs> and it's worked. It's worked great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these consortiums are always a great. I mean, we run lots of different groups for all sorts of different reasons here through the commission as well. And can't beat the deals that you can get. And like you're talking about the the. Uh, other libraries that you can connect with and work with and, and bounce ideas off of and figure out how you want to make something work. And I know a lot of times in this Pioneer group when a library's been interested, um, as you said, you go and help them with the tech aspects and whatnot, but also just being able to just talk to one of the other libraries and say, so you guys went through this and you're small like us. Talk to me about it. <laughs> Tell me, you know, how did it go? And you yeah. know, just getting an idea ahead of time. Yeah, so you basically have a whole built-in community that you have a question you know, which is like we're your neighbors. You can ask us pretty much anything you need. We can help out. I do a lot of assistance with the reporting of the system. Mm -hmm. um, it, the system doesn't have a lot of canned reports that you would see from the big ILSs. Um, and that's that's okay because that's how keeps cost low. So instead of paying for a bunch of fancy reports that we don't use, um, we're able to do a lot of customization and get exactly what we want using the SQL reporting feature that's in Koha. And then I've been able to create standard reports that all the libraries are able to utilize. And then if any of our library members have something, you know, a little, little different that they want or they, this report's good but it needs to have this and this, you know, I have no problem adding that in, into the report form and keep going. It's mm -hmm. been really uh, a lot of fun. Cool. Speaking of reports, we do have a question going back to the test data for a report that you talked about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Someone wants to know, is that taking the results of a known report and comparing it to the results of the report on the new ILS, or how is yeah, that? That's exactly what we're doing. So um, what a good example of a couple of reports. So we would run our report of what was overdue in Paulette, and then that Monday morning, so we ran that on Sunday night, and then on Monday morning when PTFS called us early Monday morning and said, okay, your data is all there, you're ready to go, we would run the, the PTFS COHA version of that report and then compare them. Mm -hmm. Keep them right off the get-go, it's like, okay, do the counts match? They do. Great. Then it looks like all of our um, overdue migrated over just like it should. We ran a report for patron fines. Again, looking at the totals, do they match up? Um, we ran reports that gave us total counts of our collection. That's how we identified we had about, um, I think about 500 records that for some reason didn't come over cleanly. So then we got into it to see why these, these 500 records didn't come across, found a little deal we missed. We didn't pick mm -hmm. it up when we had done the same testing in the sandbox. 
And then one of the BPFS migration experts was able to say, oh, I see what happened with these records. And they were able to fix it for us, you know, with a little mass change on those records and, and get them all back in shape. So having the reports to do that comparison is a very efficient way to measure the success of your data coming across. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Um, talking about tech, technology, tech expertise, and I know you did, you said you've helped a lot of libraries, but just talking in general, um, someone wants to know, did you find that there was a need for in-house tech expertise, or are you happy with vendor support um, only? Well, what we ran into was a pretty mixed bag where we had libraries that had kept their, their support up with their ILS vendor. So, for example, they were able to call their vendor and say, um, we need help with the extraction, and because they kept their support up and they were paying for that kind of support, um, their current ILS vendor was able to walk the staff there at that library through the extraction process. Um, we had a lot of libraries, though, especially on the Follett side, that hadn't been paying for support or upgrades for several years. Mm. So not only was their version of the ILS way, way out of date, um, they had no vendor assistance available to them to get their data out. Um, one, one of the things I did um, for the consortium was, was do the research and figure out um, how, to the, how to get the information, the extraction to work with like the, the version 6 of uh, fall at that a lot of libraries that joined us were on and the current version was was nine and a half and they were pretty different so you know my expertise was made available um, as part of the consortium and I had several libraries I went out on site and added the additional software that needed to be there so we could ex successfully extract their data so we're, we're you know we're willing to help um, and the fall was a good example because that must have been the bargain ILS at the time because we had a lot of our libraries and the consortium come off the old 6 and 7 over to the fall end. I remember it was very, very popular. It has been, yeah. <laughs> we, had, we had a few libraries that were on an old version of Sagebrush or an old version of Winnebago. Um, we did have a situation where the library had to contact the vendor and negotiate a deal to pay for a month's support. Mm. On this old version, on this old version of an ILS, and the vendor said, "If you pay us for a month's support, we will help you get your data out." And what was funny is, um, like Fallet, we had a situation where somebody was on a really, really old version of Fallet, and we got a different answer every time we called them. Mm -hmm. it was no, we can't help you. Okay, you pay us for a month's support, we'll help you. Or okay, you got to pay for a year's support, we'll help you. <laughs> so like, it really turned yeah. into it's like called up and got the answer you didn't want. Wait a couple of days and call them again, call and talk. maybe we'll get the answer we want. <laughs> it was, it yeah. was a really weird deal. Mm -hmm. Now, what about with PTFS, who the Pioneer Commission is now? How are they as far as, like, vendor? And I know you talked about you've contacted them, but overall they've been good, too. Yeah, PTFS has actually been around for a long, long time. They're a, mm -hmm. a big, big um, software technology vendor to the, to the federal government. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of Liblime. Mm -hmm. um, PTFS actually had some government libraries that they took the Koha community code for and got set up, and then they were approached by Libline. The founders of Libline were looking to get out of the, the business, and they bought Libline's um, fork or instance of the Koha code, and then um, basically PTFS built and then built a business unit to do this for libraries, and they've been signing up a lot of libraries going. They've got a significant deal now where they're, one of their, their key things has been the digitization and scanning business for government documents and archives and stuff. Mm -hmm. And now they've got a, a big deal with a major government library where they're going to combine um, Koha with one of their major scanning digitization products to give this uh, government entity not only an ILS, but integrate it with all the uh, digitization products that they already are using with PTFS. Nice. So there's some exciting stuff happening. Yeah. Someone here online also says that she's a longtime Koha fan, but my admins think open source has security issues. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> I would say actually open source is the only way you're going to get a secure software package because the code is open for review. Um, mm. If you're, you know, followed anything in the news with the NSA, 
at all, it turns out a bunch of the technology vendors were taking money from the NSA to give them back doors into the products that you were buying that were supposed to be secure. I mean, it's security companies that were taking NSA money to allow the NSA to get in and poke into their patrons, their, their customers' systems by providing these secret back doors so NSI snoops could go in and look at your stuff. The only way you could detect something like that is being able to actually look at the raw code and see that that kind of stuff is in there. So right now, when it comes to security, um, all bets are off because the NSA has actively um, worked with a lot of the technology vendors to gain access to virtually any major product on the market. So, I mean, we can talk the security talk, but going forward, um, open source reviewable code is the only thing I think that you could have any faith in truly being uh, secure. Because you're, you know what, you can see it yourself, you don't have to just trust someone else necessarily. No, you can, yeah. you have, you know, people on your staff that are programmers, or you have a programmer you trust, and they know mm -hmm. the language that that product is written in, they can review the code and say, mm -hmm. yeah, this thing has back doors in it, or it, did you know it was, it has this or it has that. And if you can't see the raw code, you will never know. You have no idea really what what's in there, yeah. And that's what she says. That's what I. That's just what I thought. It is more secure. So hopefully this will help her get on get her admins on board. <laughs> um, we do have a question. I'm not sure what she mean. Um, asked someone asked, do you still run into problems? Um, I'm not sure problems with what. Maybe with just the like problems from the migration. I know, April. If you can clarify which what you mean by which problems. Well, while I'm waiting for her to type that in, she may have time. Um, we have a different question someone did. We'll get back to that one. Um, how many records did you migrate, and how many staff do you have at your library? You want to see, I think, what um, we size we're talking here. We have staff of 14 at something more library. We migrated 54,000 um, bib records and 20,000 patron records over. And, and we're probably um, – kind of a medium-sized library as far as consortium is concerned. Mm -hmm. There and are smaller there, ones in the group, yeah. There's much smaller yeah. ones in the group. And it, again, um, the attraction to them for the consortium was obviously the low cost, but B, then they gained the support of the other consortium libraries, so they didn't have to be an expert or become an expert on it. You know, we're here to help and assist with anything they need. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it, being able to have um, more control over your own system is just kind of a... Uh, makes you feel better about just what it is. I mean, like you said, some of these libraries had such old file systems, and I'm sure they knew, um, but it was just they couldn't afford to update or didn't have anyone on hand who could get them updated or knew what to do, and they were, you know, struggling through. And I think just getting being able to feel so much more confident in we know our system now, we know it's good, and we have people who can help us is also a plus yeah, for this too. For the small feature libraries. that our staff just loved was hold slips. We were writing all our hold slips by hand because Follett didn't have an option for it. And when you would call Follett, they would say that they would add it to their enhancements list. And then the other bad thing about dealing with Fallhead is they don't like public libraries. They mm -hmm. like school libraries. Ah. So if you talk to them and you were a public library, you were already treated like a second-class citizen. A lot of libraries, there wasn't anything maybe available that libraries, public libraries could afford, and that's why a lot of them jumped to them whether Follett wanted them or not right. <laughs> in Whereas, the past. Let's say, you know, when we migrated to Koha, let's say it didn't have the ability to print a whole slip. Um, we could have got together as a consortium, I'm guessing for a couple thousand dollars to pay PPF as a programmer, they would add a whole slip feature for us. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the beauty of the open source and, and using a, a vendor to support it is if there's a feature we need and we want, we don't have to have our own programmers on staff to create it. We can go to them, and they quote, they'll spec out. It'll take us, you know, this 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 much programming time, mm -hmm. this much testing time. Here's the date we could have it to you, and here's the cost. And we're able to uh, solicit that information every year before we get ready to put our budget together. And then we have a technical committee where we'll sit down and select, kind of prioritize the new features that everybody wants see what kind of money we have to spend, and then we can say, okay, we're going to add these three features to the uh, consortium this year. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a great setup. You get exactly mm -hmm. what you want. 
you get it done exactly the way you want. It, just the personalization of it, just, just, yeah, the personalization part of it is what I just love. You know, you go to them, they do it, and it's not you're waiting for this giant company to decide enough of their libraries who pay them want this feature, so now we'll finally get around to doing something about it. It's a much more one-on-one right. -on -one for you guys. And then it's made available as the whole point of open source to any other groups who may have not, you know, have wanted the same feature as well. They'll then be able right. to find and we that and grab have, it. Um, um, two major consortiums, Click in Colorado and um, SEOS in Wisconsin, that we're now we formed a users group because they're both PTFS customers <laughs> also, mm -hmm. and now we're actually combining our efforts on having features added to the ILS. So nice. SEOS wants the same feature we do. We now share the cost to get it, so we're even reducing our expenses even more and even benefiting more libraries. So it just keeps getting better and better. I can't say enough about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, okay, the problems was, she's asking where it's more actually day-to-day -day technical type things, weeding problems or how to check out magazines. Apparently there's been some problems with just the day-to-day, you know, -day, um, specifically um, with what's been going on. Are yeah, some of those things still happening in some libraries? That's more of an issue with how your consortium is set up. Um, what we discovered in Pioneer is every library was doing periodicals differently. Hmm. Nobody did things the same way. Um, at, at SUMP, we don't catalog our periodicals. We use what we call the mag bag, where you bring it over, and we have uh, these mylar bags that are barcoded, and then we uh, check you out the mag bag and then add a note to that item of what magazines or comic books or whatever are in it. Um, other large libraries like Lincoln and that do a lot of magazine stuff. What was nice is the system's versatile enough that everybody was kind of still able to do their periodicals the way they want. But because everybody does them so different, it's been very hard for us to kind of agree on a standard method consortium-wide. Hmm. So that's more, I would say, an issue of being part of a consortium. And then what's a little different about the Pioneer Consortium is we don't actually actively share our collections. So we're all together in the same system, but if you're if you want a book that's at Holdridge Library, and you're a member of my library, you can't check out Holdridge's book. I can go do an IOL offline and get it for you, but we don't do it within the consortium. Whereas right. SCLS and Click are what I would call true consortiums. They run their libraries are all run as one giant library with a bunch of branches. So if you check out if you're um, Click. In your library, you check out an item that's at another library, they actually handle all that internally as part of their consortium. Right, it's a different I, situation. I that would yeah. be somewhere where we would love to get to at some point with the idea that we had a statewide consortium and we could share our resources down to the collection and item level. Right, because this is the Pioneer Consortium, but it's just an automation consortium just for the software. Not in yeah, what some people think of as a consortium as we all share our books and items and resources among between each other. Yeah, it's a different. Yeah, at this point, it's at a different level. We're, yeah, we're a consortium in in iOS operations and cost, and that mm -hmm. kind of is where we've drawn the line at this point. Right. Yeah. Um, last couple of questions here, related to related questions. Um, what is the one thing that you did during the migration that you would tell people not to do? Um, we took a lot of time to plan ahead. So our migration, I was, we were all very satisfied with how our migration went. Mm. Um, like word of warning with something some, that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would use for some of the example libraries, some of our small libraries, we had a real issue where they just, they didn't, they didn't practice or train at all. Mm. You know, we, we helped them get their data out, we helped them clean their data up a little bit, they migrated, and then they're like, you know, calling us, it's like, you know, how do I put a book on hold? You know, and they had plenty of time to test ahead of that, but that's, you know, my experience with the other libraries is, is train, 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 train. Mm -hmm. As much training as you can do ahead of time, get your staff up to speed, get them comfortable, it's total payoff. Right. But none of that is a waste. And that may be well, the other half of this question that this uh, group asked is what we would say is the one thing you should not skip in the process. This, it, what step? Yeah. <laughs> that kind of leads right into it. Yeah. Don't skip out on that yeah, training. You, Don't you think should, you can just kind of go on the fly and figure it out. 
Yeah, because of the sandbox environment that PTFS provides um, to our consortium, where you literally have all your data in a in a in a sandbox, a playground environment before you ever go live. There is no reason that your staff should not be fully trained and fully up to speed on how everything's going to work before you go live. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, there's just no excuse. You literally have a working system that you could be training on and practicing on, you know, before before it really counts and you're actually live running the, the library on it. All right, that's nice. You don't have to just be dumped into it blind. <laughs> yeah, it's not one of those things where here's kind of a demo system where you can kind of fool around. I mean, this is exactly what you're going to have when you go live. It's it, just invaluable. Mm -hmm. So then once we're live, if we want to, like, make parameter changes and see how it works and what it's going to impact, we have a sandbox available for that. So if we want to, as a consortium, we want to change mm -hmm. some rules, we can actually go to the sandbox, change some of our operating parameters within the software, and then we can actually check some books in and out and cost some fines and things, and we can actually see what's going to happen. So where there's no unintended consequences. We nice. know exactly how this is going to work mm -hmm. if we change the rule on this fine or that fine or when something becomes lost. Mm -hmm. We can try that all out ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, one final question. I think you're some the same person asking about the issues. Um, can you try before? Yeah, can you try before you buy? I think she's meaning if she wants to be, if they want to be part of the Pioneer Consortium, can they see, you know, get maybe a test or check, you know, some sort of demo or something before deciding yeah, to you bet. join um, in? I've gone out. Uh, Steve Bossman, who has our membership committee, has gone out and demoed the product for the libraries who are interested in joining. Uh, we've granted them access into the sandbox, nice. so they could actually. Um, get into the sandbox, give them a login, and they could go in and play around in the sandbox and try stuff out. Again, mm -hmm. that, that sandbox environment is just an absolute must-have for what you're able to um, test, train, demo. Mm -hmm. it, it's great. Mm -hmm. I can't say enough about it. And that's nice. That's a, and that's different because you can actually get the behind-the-scenes staff app version as well. I mean, you can go to all these libraries' web pages and see their catalog of the system, which is nice. But as far as working with it yourself as an actual employee, that's the other side that you can't see without right. having that kind of behind-the-scenes access. Yeah, so a good example is you want to delete a book and see what happens in the catalog. We can't do it on my live system. No. But, hey, <laughs> you know what? Go, in, go in the sandbox delete a book that's got a hold on it or it's checked out, see what happens. Mm -hmm. you know, Go to town, blow yeah. It up. <laughs> Try to break it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, that was our last question. Um, anybody else have any last urgent questions? Of course, you can contact Sherm at his, uh, you got the phone number and email up there or contact the library. Um, like I said, I've got the links to the consortium in the, will be available um, when the recording is put out as well. Um, I also added a link to some own Memorial Library's own page and the two consortiums you guys are part of or are working with, Click and the SCLS in Wisconsin, Click in Colorado. So if people want to know, see what they're all about. Um, doesn't look like anything urgent has come in. We're a little after 11 o'clock, which is fine because we did start a little late. So I think we will um, wrap it up for this morning. Thank you so much for coming on today, Sherman, and telling us about this. Oh, thanks I've, for having me. I I love talking about this. Stuff. Yeah, I do. Um, I've seen, the, I know there's been many presentations around the state here at conferences and meetings that I've had on here on the show about the consortium itself and joining and what that entails, but I think this is the first time we've heard someone really talk about the nitty-gritty and the step-by-step -step of what it takes to really do the migration in, in much more detail. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of how I set this out there. It's kind of how I set this presentation up. It's not so much to sell our Pioneer Consortium, but you know, even if you chose to go with another product, um, we learned some good lessons through our process, and you know, we can save somebody some pain. Um, we'd love to be able to do that. Yeah, exactly. All these steps will work for any migration, no matter what you're going to. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much. Then I am going to pull back presenter control here to myself to switch to my screen. Do, do, do. There we go. And there is the uh, that's the Pioneer web page that I was just uh, saving there. Um, pop over here. There we go. So thank you very much, Sherm. Thank you much, everyone, for attending. Um, I hope it was uh, useful to you. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be available later today on the website. Um, here, down in our archived Encompass Live Sessions section here, we have the um, archives of all of our previous shows that you can watch. You can see the videos, if there's a PowerPoint presentation, any links that were related to the show. 
Um, I hope so. That will wrap it up for this morning. I hope you join us next week when our topic is password management and security. Um, not necessarily a fun topic, but an important topic <laughs> um, for everyone, libraries, um, patrons, everyone included. Um, Jasmine Dean, who is the director um, in uh, Chubbuck, Idaho, of the Portneuf District Library, will be online with us to talk about how to create and keep. Um, your, your passwords secure. Um, at libraries we have passwords for everything just like people do at home and as well and so she's going to give a great presentation next week for that. So sign up for that. Join us there next week. Um, if you are a um, Facebook user please do like us on Facebook. We do have a web page for the show. Um, if you do that you'll get notifications of um, when uh, new new shows have started. Uh, when our recordings are available, anything we'll have here on our website. So if you are a big Facebook user, go ahead. Please do like us there. Other than that, that will wrap us wrap it up for this morning. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next week on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.